by December 1943, when the Johnny Newsmen had been expelled from England for all their labours, it was time to get to the bottom of what constituted a joint British-United States war effort. Not everything was still clear, but enough facts had accumulated to visualise the contours of the shape into which history was being moulded. As decided by the Allies shortly after the events at Pearl Harbour, the Anglo-American War against Germany was directed by Roosevelt and Churchill through personal negotiations at historic conferences. At these conferences, Roosevelt and Churchill jointly decided what to do next, and between conferences the war in the West was fought according to these decisions. Continuity in the direction of the war was ensured by a group of top officers, composed of representatives of all three branches of the armed forces of both countries, and called the Council of Chiefs of General Stavnene. This August body was split in 80 between Washington and London, but functioned continuously, and its jurisdiction extended over the whole world. The English members of the Council had their permanent representatives in Washington. The full Council met at Allied conferences wherever they were appointed. The first and main function of the Council of the Chiefs of General Staff was to advise the heads of both states at these conferences. The members of the Council prepared the information on the basis of which the heads of state made their decisions. Each historic conference lasted for two weeks, and here is a list of them, indicating where and when they were held, and what the most important questions were settled. 1. December 1941, Washington. Resolved that the defeat of Germany is the first priority over the defeat of Japan. Decided to prepare and execute an invasion across the English Channel during 1942. Subsequently, the invasion of France was postponed and replaced by the invasion of Africa. However, this decision was the result of negotiations in London, without a historic conference and without the personal participation of the heads of state. 2. January 1943. Casablanca, it is decided to invade Sicily, while continuing to stealthily prepare for the second postponed invasion across the English Channel. 3. May 1943. Washington, it is decided to invade northwest France in the spring of 1944, preparations to begin immediately. 4. August 1943. Quebec. Plans for invasion of northwest France in spring 1944 approved, command in principle assigned. 5. November, December 1943. Cairo to Tehran, date for invasion of northwest Europe, May 1 finally decided and commanders of invasion forces appointed. 6. September 1944. Quebec developed plans for the defeat of Japan, which should follow Tehuati after the certainly predetermined collapse of Germany. 7. January, February 1945. Malta, Yalta. The Yalta Conference is also known as the Crimean Conference. Plans continued for the defeat of Japan, which would follow the foregone collapse of Germany. Strategic instructions were given for the decisive assault on Germany and agreement was reached on the post-war division of Germany into zones of occupation. As we have said, the Council of Chiefs of General Staff consisted of representatives of the top commanders of all three branches of the armed forces, both the United States and the British Empire. First, each of these gentlemen was in two capacities. First, he was a member of the Council of Chiefs of General Staff, and second, he was a member of the highest military council of his state. The supreme military councils of both states, of course, existed independently and were responsible each only to his own government, since each of the Chiefs of General Staffs of all three arms, both in the United States and England, played the role of his own double in the Allied Council, it was enough for him to tell himself what he should do as a member of the highest staff body of his state, in order to carry out the decisions of the Council. Coordination of actions occurred automatically, and no friction could not even arise. If in the intervals between the joint meetings of the highest staff bodies of one or the other state did not acquire individual features, and were not sometimes supporters of opposite directions of military thought. In such cases, the chiefs of general staff of one state tried to influence the commanders of the active forces through the head of his second self, a member of the joint body of the Allies. 18. 
in Europe. Most often this sim British chiefs of general staff, whose main apartments, of course, were located in London. Thus, two days before the American 7th Army sailed from Italy and Corsica to invade southern France, the British chiefs of staff spoke directly with the British commander-in-chief in the Mediterranean theatre and instructed him to consider a complete abandonment of the proposed invasion and the replacement of this operation with another, namely, to move the 7th Army no, no less than in Brest, according to recent reports just occupied by General Patton. The British in this case clearly broke the rules, for the Supreme Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces in the Mediterranean Theatre of Operations was formally subordinate not to the British, but to the Council of Chiefs of General Staff as a whole. More, they were obliged to obey the decision to invade southern France, adopted at the last conference by Roosevelt and Churchill. The British Chiefs of General Staff did send a copy of the cablegram to their American counterparts in Washington for information, in response to which some frank thoughts were expressed about the violation of the order of agreed decisions, and this was done in a rather harsh manner. Thereupon the British hastily scuttled their attempt to thwart the invasion of southern France. It was, to say the least, a strange venture for at that time there was not enough tonnage in the Mediterranean Sea to transport troops to Brest. But this incident is very characteristic, as an external and clear manifestation of those internal hidden contradictions that affected the entire course of the war and to the consideration of which we will now come to. Generally speaking, the system of directing military operations through a body uniting the chiefs of general staff of both states under the auspices 83 of the heads of these states, personally agreeing with each other to make historical decisions proved to be extremely effective. There is no doubt that such a system of command of the Allied Armed Forces in its effectiveness is unprecedented in the history of warfare. Its greatest virtue was its simplicity of organization and the fact that it relied on personal communication, on negotiations without intermediaries to avoid misunderstandings. But what is important for understanding the course of the war is how smoothly the mechanism of the Joint Chiefs of Staff worked, and the contradiction in British and American interests, which was found in all the decisions taken, and which this mechanism smoothed, mitigated, and masked. This contradiction was very tangible, and it was rooted in the following. Both the British Empire and the United States sought the complete defeat of the armed forces of the German, Japanese and Italian empires. The United States limited this ambition to almost nothing. In other words, it wanted to defeat the enemy's armed forces in the shortest possible time, and in the shortest possible way, reckoning only with the risk of suffering unnecessary losses in men, and not at all with the cost of material resources. In their desire to win the war, the United States did not count on political considerations, they were equally willing to make a deal with some Darlin, if it could ensure their success in Africa, and did not oppose Stalin's success in the Balkans, as long as both would bring the final victory over the armed forces of the Axis powers. American war aims could be summarized as defeat the armed forces of the Axis powers, period. The British Empire, too, wanted to defeat the armed forces of the Axis powers, but only with 84 to strategy that would best serve the complex economic and political interests of the British Empire. Pure military objective for Britain does not exist at all, except in a military operation of a scale no larger than a minor skirmish. The British always mix political motives with military motives. I am not discussing here the comparative merits of the two positions. I simply wish to set forth the factual background without going beyond the impression which, on the basis of personal experience, we had firmly formed in England by December 1943. For six months we had been studying the strategy of the war as a whole and following the military actions arising out of the decisions of the Allied conferences. Our task was to comprehend the actual military essence of events. After all, we together with our allies were preparing the grandest invasion in history. By December 1943, the American army already had two years of war experience, including successful campaigns in Africa and Sicily, and the beginning of the Italian campaign. 
the profound contradiction between American and British policy was already an undeniable fact to us. We looked upon it as a natural disaster, as one of the military difficulties, if you will, that we planless strategists had to take into account. When the center of military events moved to Europe, the contradiction between American and British war aims manifested itself primarily in the dispute over whether the main route to Europe should be through the Mediterranean or the English Channel. The history of this dispute is languorously monotonous and consists almost entirely of repetition. The historical conference decides to strike at the heart of the German Empire across the Channel. The conference closes, and it would seem that both nations 85 should without delay take up the task. But nothing of the kind happens. Again, the conference, and again it is decided in the first place to carry out an invasion across the Channel. The conference participants snap their briefcases and go home. And again, by some mysterious coincidence, the preparations for the Channel invasion are postponed. And again, heads of state and chiefs of general staff gather. And again, the ardent desire is expressed to fight the enemy immediately. And again, as soon as the conference is closed, something, for some reason, somehow paralyzes the planned actions. At each postponement, the invasion of France across the Channel is replaced by some new operation in the Mediterranean. Clarification. Early in 1942, Roosevelt and Churchill agreed that an invasion across the Channel would be undertaken in the fall of that year, when the US Navy declared that it was not ready and could not undertake the transfer of troops across the strait, the US Army came to the rescue. General Somerville established an engineer landing service on Cape Cod and instructed it to assemble, provide crews, and keep ready the necessary number of landing craft. But it was not until the summer of 1942 that England began training troops and building landing craft that an invasion was deemed impracticable. However, England was packed with troops, both British and American, and world public opinion demands. So the troops, which proved impossible to transport across the 20-mile-wide strait, were loaded onto transports and moved a thousand miles across the open sea to land in Africa. A few weeks after the events at Pearl Harbor, the President of the United States said that 80 Sid Mediterranean was an English problem, and that America should concentrate her efforts on the main objective, the continent of Europe. And yet a whole American army lands on the African shore of the Mediterranean and begins a campaign that consumes all our resources. When the President of the United States and the British Prime Minister met again at Casablanca, the whole world assumed that what would be discussed was not the immediate phase of the African campaign, but the phase following the immediate one. The armies on the fronts had in fact already exceeded all their objectives. But there was no order on what to do next, not even an agreed plan. Military industry and mobilization in America was still unfolding. The African campaign had exhausted all the reserves we had. It had been originally conceived as a good means of occupying the American soldiers sent to England for the now defunct invasion. And now this campaign was sucking all the juice out of us. True, the African campaign must soon be over and soon the troops involved will be able to be utilized. But they will be in Africa. And where to get transport ships to ferry them back to England for the invasion across the Channel, as agreed? For the transfer of troops from England to Africa, transportation means were found. But to return them from Africa to England, suddenly there was not a single ship. Therefore, at the conference in Casablanca, it was decided to start all over again and wait until, for the invasion across the Channel, will not be trained new troops and made in America new ammunition. In the meantime, world public opinion was pressing for action. Not only the Russians, dissatisfied with the invasion of Africa, demanded the opening of a second front. A lot of people in America and in England were waiting for the rapid realization of the upcoming ATSM victory in Tunisia. In addition, we could not forget the impact that the military policy of the Allies had on over two Zeruwalshishi satellites of Germany and on such large neutral states such as Sweden, Spain and Turkey, not to mention the morale of the peoples of the occupied countries and the mood of the multi-million masses and their leaders in Asia. So when Churchill proposed another intermediate step, 
again in anticipation of an invasion across the channel. Roosevelt agreed. The mountain of newspaper headlines into which the Casablanca conference had become agonizingly pushed for six whole months and finally gave birth to a Sicilian mouse. The strategic dispute over whether to reach Germany by the short route across the English Channel or the long detour across the Mediterranean and the Balkans was still decided in favor of an invasion from the north. But two steps had already been taken on the southern route. When Churchill met again with Roosevelt in May, this time in Washington, a landing operation to invade Sicily was still in preparation. This not only tied up British and American troops stationed in Africa, but increased the demands for additional military forces that America could field and for the tonnage needed to bring those forces to the theatre of operations. This latter circumstance was particularly important, for the voyage of a caravan of ships from America to Africa was much longer than the voyage from America to Great Britain. The plan to invade across the English Channel fascinated the Americans, primarily because, of course, the French coast was the nearest point at which the American army could strike a direct blow to the armed forces of the Axis powers. To organize an invasion across the English Channel American naval transport could do twice as much as to organize a landing in the Mediterranean Sea. The same ship 8080 could transport twice as many soldiers to England than in Africa, to make twice as many trips in the same period. Moreover, the British forces in England, supplied with materials produced locally, would not need sea transportation at all. In Africa, on the other hand, they were entirely dependent on what the caravans of ships delivered. So when the next historic conference for the third time confirmed the Allies' adamant determination to recognize the priority of the invasion across the Channel, it was confronted with the fact that the compromise invasion in Sicily absorbs all the resources that England and America are able to produce and transpond. Therefore, the participants in the May Conference had no choice but either not to set the day of invasion at all or to postpone it for a year. It was assumed that by that time the training of men, military equipment and naval transport in America will reach such fantastic proportions that it will be possible to carry out two major operations, one in the distant Mediterranean Sea, the other in the northwest of Europe, poor Pacific Ocean. And it will suffer because of the same Mediterranean Sea. To understand the further course of events, let's leave the historic conferences and see what happens in between. The invasion of Sicily was defined as an operation with limited objectives. It was assumed that as soon as we captured Sicily, Italy would take its breath away. This would have been politically gratifying and would have provided us with air bases. But after the first successes of favorably unfolded operations, there are voices in favor of allowing the offensive to creep a few miles up the toe, 89 Italian boot. Council of Chiefs of General Staff decides accordingly, specifically stipulating that the Mediterranean armies should advance exactly as far as necessary to avoid shelling from the Straits of Messina and not a step further. But at this point in history, the Italian government does capitulate, and thus the mission assigned by the historic conference to the invasion of Sicily, known by the code name Husky, is accomplished. It would seem that a safe end has come, not only to the operation in Sicily, but to the whole Mediterranean diversion. Now that Sicily is occupied and Italy out of the war, the victorious Allied armies and air power and flotillas of assault landing craft will be urgently used for the invasion across the English Channel, a decision on which all obliged. There is no doubt that the Germans, with a defeated Italy around their necks, are in no position to launch a counter-attack in the Mediterranean, a counter-attack which would require a landing operation in Sicily or on the remote African coast. The Italian fleet is in Allied hands, and the British have complete control of the Mediterranean, thus leaving a small defensive barrier in the Sicilian mountains. It was possible to send all the army and all the aircraft to England. There will pull landing ships, which in England will be added to the transport, means freed up due to the shortened route from America. But nothing of the kind happened. Why? In September 8, 1943, the Quebec Conference closed. 
The next conference would not be held until November in Cairo. In the meantime, the American and British general staff, each separately and both together, as the Joint Chiefs of Staff Council, acting as three different organizations and appealing to the two heads Knighty of State, somehow authorize a further offensive deep into Italy, with all the forces of the Mediterranean Theater of Operations. This time it is decided to advance to Naples, and not a step further, because the Germans very indecently invaded Rome quite significant forces and chased away our parliamentarians. The capture of Naples requires another landing operation, which is being conducted at Salerno, with a corresponding loss of landing craft, caused both by enemy action and normal wear and tear, and consequently more ammunition to be sent to the Mediterranean. Johnny Newbys fully proved their yokels by experiencing extreme bewilderment at what was happening in England in the summer of 1943 following the firm decision to remove all obstacles to the invasion of Europe. Curiously enough, Mr. Harry Hopkins, who at the August conference had referred to the shortage of landing craft throughout the world, listened with surprise in October to my report on the insufficient number of landing craft in the Channel. A major factor in the September decision to go on the offensive in Italy, a decision not sanctified by the historic conference, was the pressure of the British Prime Minister and the British General Staffs. Marshall's famous report, written after the end of the war, still carries the suspicion and distrust he experienced at the time. Our aim was to avoid a situation in which Italy would be a bottomless barrel for us, threatening to absorb all the resources accumulated for the invasion across the Channel, just as the Germans were exsanguinated in the North African campaign. Marshall emphasized his statement by the fact that with these words he ended the work in which he outlined his strategic conception of the war as a whole. So Italy is already breathing on the incense, and I in my narrative have already passed December 1943 and found myself in the historic year of 1944. After bloody battles fell Naples, another operation. Again the very last is scheduled in Italy. We are talking about Rome. After Rome promises the Mediterranean front, we will be satisfied. January is coming to an end. Until the 1st of May, the day appointed for the invasion across the Channel, a little more than three months remain. The ships that are to carry the landing troops have not yet been built. No one even knows if they will be ready in time. And yet another landing force is being prepared and conducted in the Mediterranean Sea. The landing troops move up along the coast and land at Anzio. This time, the whole operation is organized by Churchill himself. He thought it over, recovering from pneumonia in the African city of Marrakesh, and all the preparations did not take three weeks. According to the plan, the landing troops should join the column of ground troops, which will break through to Anzio from the land, through Casino and the mountains. On January 22, Allied troops landed at Anzio, and a week later, the Allied Supreme Commander in the Mediterranean and the Commanders-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Active Forces, the general staffs of both countries and their governments, all already knew that the offensive in Italy froze. The land column was stopped in the ruins of Casino, and the landing operation was localized in Anzio. Now, for prestige's sake, we need to cling to Anzio. We need the column to break through the Casino Mountain Pass. After many months of bloody fighting and the loss of many thousands of lives, the airborne and ground forces are finally united. The entire Italian campaign, from a military point of view, made no sense. And by the end, there wasn't even any military and political sense left. In June, when we broke into the port of Cherbourg, in all the streets, still 92, hung very spectacular posters of the German Ministry of Propaganda, which depicted a snail crawling on the toe of the Italian boot. On one horn of the snail fluttered the British flag, on the other, the American flag. And the inscription explained that the real snail would move faster than the Allied troops in Italy. From a historical perspective, what apparently happened was this. A British quarterback was rushing with all his legs to get the ball into the Balkan goal. He was held up first by Roosevelt, who hung on to him and managed to get him to slow down. 
but in doing so Roosevelt himself was almost dragged to the penalty box. Then, at the December conference in Tehran, Stalin also jumped on the back of the fast runner and almost, but not quite, forced him to his knees, putting the question of invasion across the channel as a yes or no question. But even with Stalin and Roosevelt on him, Churchill still managed to drag himself a few more steps. In a strange irony of fate, it took Hitler to bring the British champion down to earth. On the line of defence at Anzio, thereby predicting his own demise a year or so later among the ruins of Berlin. Had Hitler allowed the offensive at Anzio to develop successfully, plans for an invasion across the Channel might have been buried forever, and the end of the war pushed back another year. For the sole purpose of proving that the British are a great nation that can be knocked down but never, never knocked out, the British general staff and its generals scraped together the troops and ammunition for a final offensive in Italy on the very eve of victory over Germany. It was scraped together. For Field Marshal Alexander used Poles, French, Brazilians, Canadians and, of course, Americans and British to advance in the Apennines. At the of April 1945, he managed to force the Po River and approach Trieste at 93 strike distance before the judge's whistle blew. Trieste is the threshold of the Balkans. Why the British so clapped for the invasion of Germany through the Balkans? About this I will say later. Here it is enough to say that by the end of 1943 this pull of the British to the Balkans was obvious to us all. The Balkans were the magnet to which, no matter how you shake the compass, invariably pointed the arrow of British strategy. From the very beginning to the very end, this British interest in the Balkans was the force that constantly countered American military strategy in the European theatre of war. This interest carried England so far that its Prime Minister, agitating for an invasion of the Balkans, even put into circulation a false formula of his own coinage, calling the most impregnable and most easily defended mountain barriers on the continent the vulnerable underbelly of Europe. And Sekel could not always curb his desires, and often overstepped the bounds of truth. At the beginning of the war, in order to secure U.S. aid, he addressed a wavering America with the notorious phrase, Give us arms and we'll get the job done. And Churchill and all the initiated knew perfectly well that there was no weapon in the world, except for the then undiscovered atomic bomb, with which England alone could do the job, and there was no reason to demand this of England. England had a clear desire to bring the full weight of the combined Anglo-American armed forces down on the Balkans. On the other hand, by the end of 1943, with full clarity revealed its strong reluctance to cross the English Channel. On this point, at least at the conference table, she had like-minded Americans. The invasion across the Channel, as such, 94 had powerful opponents in the most prominent positions, not only in England but also in America. First of all, the supreme command of the American Air Force, General Arnold, who headed the American Air Force, and was at the same time a member of the Council of Chiefs of General Staff, still believed that Germany could be forced to surrender by aerial bombardment alone, mess and since end and he could get enough men and war materials for the needs of aviation and achieve priority over other weapons. Both he himself and his generals and press liaison officers fought against the invasion, subtly but forcefully, insisting on the need to strengthen the Air Force to the fullest extent possible. They were always in favour of postponements and delays in order to buy time, and after waiting for new planes and training new cadres of pilots to bring them down on Germany. What motivated them to do this was apparently a sincere adoration of their own kind of weaponry, as well as personal ambition. They were playing a politico-military game in the belief that if they succeeded in defeating Germany with air attacks alone, aviation would automatically take first place among the other branches of the armed forces. To be honest, no one even now could decide whether they were right, that is, would Germany have continued the war if, say, 5,000 heavy bombers were raining down on it every day? Even when the invasion began, the largest air formations numbered no more than a thousand four-engine machines. The demands of the Air Force was never fully satisfied, but already a year before the invasion of France, aviation in its power was far ahead of other American military forces in England. 
and her command continued to insist on giving her advantages at the expense of other weapons, which 95 would not have been necessary had it been able to prove its case. The American Navy was even less disposed in favor of invasion than the American Air Force. The United States Navy is the most monolithic of the branches of the armed forces and the best able to defend its interests. It knows what it wants, and in any dispute its representatives speak with one voice. The war in the Pacific was their war. The invasion of Europe meant a war on the Atlantic, in which the American Navy had no interest. The war in the Atlantic was a racket given by the British, to which the American Navy was not invited, and it participated reluctantly and with distrust. His war was the Pacific War, and he could not heartily endorse the world's strategic plans, which required first the defeat of Germany and only after that of Japan. This coldness of the American Navy toward the European theatre of war was further compounded by the personal and professional antipathy which the American Navy harboured toward the British Navy, for it regarded it as lethargic, obsolete, and severely over. I am by no means saying that the United States Navy deliberately sabotaged the invasion of Europe. Its admirals obeyed Roosevelt's decision to defeat Germany first. They were good soldiers and didn't spoil the game. Sometimes they even made major contributions to the common cause, but they never really stood up for American interests in the European theater of war at the conference table. And meanwhile, in skirmishes with the British, we had no tougher, braver, and more reliable warriors than Admiral King and other American admirals. The British were afraid of them. From all fights with them, the United States Navy always came out victorious. Now, the passive attitude of the American Navy to the invasion of Europe had the further consequence that the American land army had to literally snatch from the fleet landing craft, and later, to realize the landing, its firepower. For the sake of prestige, the U.S. Navy, on the eve of the decision to land in Europe, conducted a successful campaign to prevent the army from preparing ships for landing operations, as we have seen the U.S. Army in 1942 wanted to organize the crossing of troops across the English Channel on its own ships. Therefore, in 1943, the organization of the transfer of American landing troops almost entirely depended on the British Navy. This gave the British the opportunity to categorically determine the scope of the forthcoming invasion, at their discretion setting the number of ships they could provide, and there was only one means of overcoming this bottleneck. To get help from the American Navy and utilize the capabilities of the American shipbuilding industry under its command. At the last minute, the bottleneck was safely passed, but for many months, the negative attitude of the American Navy served as a serious obstacle. Besides the Air Force and the Navy, there were other adversaries in Washington with whom the Army had to contend. There can be no doubt that some of the persons with whom Roosevelt consulted were using all their influence to thwart the invasion. I cannot name their names or know their motives, but I have circumstantial evidence that there were persons. The American headquarters in England believed at the time that the uncertainty in Washington was the carambole of the English hitting us with a ricochet. I doubt it. There is always enough hesitation and uncertainty in Washington without it. But 90 C in whatever the reasons, in the United States found influential people who sowed doubt and anxiety, and their voices were still loudly heard some two months before the invasion. Only Roosevelt's iron will silence them. Now that it is all behind us, it is easy to forget that in 1943 there was no shortage of warnings from highly respected military circles. According to many military experts, a successful invasion of the European fortress was simply impossible. Johnny Newby advocates of its realization were not only rebuked for their naivety and ill advisedness, but were called braggarts or brave, depending on the attitude. The natural anxiety of the military about whether an invasion across the Channel was feasible and desirable from a purely military point of view supported the British in their special position on the war on the continent. As in any winning case, the English position could be defended from many angles and come to the same conclusion each time.
One such argument was England's desire to win the war with as few casualties as possible, and the British, and quite sincerely, believed that only at the cost of heavy losses they could storm the French coast and defeat the German army. Of course, every state would like to win the war with the least loss of human life. However, the desire of the English to avoid bloodshed was specific to their particular, purely English problem. Here is the reason why the English so stubbornly wanted to avoid bloodshed. The English are perfectly aware of their political and economic failures of the 20s and 30s. Among thinking Englishmen, there are many 98 advocates of the view, and they constitute an influential intellectual block that these failures are the direct result of the losses suffered on the battlefields of the First World War. According to one of the most important and inalienable principles on which the English notion of national leadership rests, the aristocracy risks its lives in battle at critical moments and by a display of personal courage maintains its leadership role. But the social stratum from which England draws its leaders is extremely limited. Considering the size and resources of the British Empire, it can be said that the circle of selected individuals destined for this role and trained in England is ridiculously narrow. The idea of replenishing the ranks of the aristocracy of individual natives of the lower and middle classes is quite realistic and fruitful, but even this compromise measure, allowing talent to filter through the public filter, does not change the situation. A group of people on whose decisions depend on the fate of 550 million people inhabiting the British Empire, it is almost infinitesimal for the British. Therefore, war with the direct involvement of the British themselves is a very serious problem. The principle of personal leadership of the upper classes requires too many battlefield sacrifices from this handful of people. Until a new generation has time to grow up in Little Britain, there will be a shortage of gifted and trained men capable of leading a worldwide endeavour called the British Empire. At least that is what the British think. In 1914-1918 in France, England did indeed lose a disastrous number of young aristocrats. And since, as aristocrats died, their place was taken by the most able members of the middle classes, they suffered great losses. Mindful of this, the British attributed their mistakes of the 20s and 30s largely to the fact that they had allowed too many Englishmen to be killed in the First World War. They lamented the lost generation in the literal sense of the word. It was their profound belief that the principle of the British Empire being ruled by a handful of inhabitants of the British Isles could not sustain another devastation in the ranks of the aristocracy. War in the air and at sea claimed enough lives, but it was still not the same as a long and bloody war on land. The English government dreaded it as a hopeless patient dreads the outcome of his illness. And here is another, no less convincing, argument in favour of England's position. In the fall of 1940, the British Empire was on the brink of destruction, such an immediate danger she has not known in its history. It survived by a miracle against all odds. In surviving, she found herself the inner insecurity that had been the cause or consequence of her failure to prevent the outbreak of the Second World War had disappeared, and she had indeed united under Churchill's leadership. An imposing distance separated her from the terrible days that followed the Dunkirk disaster. In the summer of 1940, all the odds were in favour of the Germans conquering England and the British Empire as such would cease to exist. By the summer of 1943, with the Russians already on the return march from the walls of Stalingrad and America finally entering the war, it was clear to anyone capable of looking into the future that England had popped out. In that case, why take the risk? Wouldn't it matter if the war lasted another year, or five, or ten? In the long gallop of history, the English favourite's place was assured. The position of the British could be viewed. One hundred which often did, and Americans and Europeans, even from another, more cynical point of view. According to cynics, since 1942, the British speculated on Russian lives and American dollars, which brought them quite a decent bank interest. So what's the rush? The profit from Russian lives was that the longer Russia fought, the weaker it would be at the end of the war, 
and the easier it would be for the British to challenge the Russians for dominance in post-war Europe. The profit that American dollars brought was even more immediate, for the entire English wartime economy was based on the siphoning off of lend-lease funds, with the English government, despite the surprise with which it later met its abolition, knowing full well that it was a purely military endeavour. There has never been a time in history when one nation has borrowed from another on similar terms. In analysing the motives of an individual, much less of an entire nation, there is always the risk of overdoing it and getting entangled in excessive subtleties. I will cite one more consideration, which is not at all contradictory to the above, but in which there is much more simple common sense. The military experience gained by the summer of 1943 certainly spoke against a hasty invasion of northwestern Europe. There was no question that in this operation the odds would be on Germany's side. It was to beat the German armies on the battlefield under different conditions than had taken place at Stalingrad and in Africa. Until the Second World War there had been no successful naval landing carried out by modern methods of warfare 11, 101. During World War II T, the success of amphibious operations in Africa and Sicily contributed to the success of landing operations in Africa and Sicily. And in addition in both cases, the invasion armies met only weak resistance from the French who do not know who to fight for war-weary Italians, or landings were made in unprotected points of the coast in Africa, or used favourable weather in the Mediterranean Sea and the German fortifications on the Atlantic coast were considered even more impregnable than they turned out to be in fact. To strengthen them at the disposal of 102, the enemy was a 2102 2 met manpower and material resources of the whole continent. They were supported by aviation from coastal bases. Whole German armies stood in reserve and could be thrown into any breakthrough. Therefore, since luck has turned to us and the Allies are winning the war, what prudent man could speak out in favour of so risky an enterprise as an invasion across the Channel? In case of failure, happiness would inevitably turn away from us again, and Europe would lose its last glimmer of hope. We would have to make extensive military preparations again, and the huge German armies in Western Europe, having repulsed our offensive, will be thrown against the Russians who are beginning to tire. Needless to say, they were equally compelling arguments for invasion. American arguments, which were guided by Roosevelt and his American advisers. The essence of the American argument was that the Germans could be defeated by force and courage, and that it was not safe to leave them free to pursue their malicious plans across the continent. It was a sound argument, even independent of humanistic motives, to end the suffering of the many millions of Europe's population by considerations already discussed. France is the nearest territory occupied by the enemy to America. If we open a front in France, only shortened voyages across the Atlantic will be necessary to supply it. And this is very important, because our second war in the Pacific is stalling for want of ships. Our will to war, in keeping with the national character of Americans, depended entirely on quick success. It demanded a decisive and speedy reprisal against the enemy, for after the war in Europe we would have to finish the war in the East. 103. This was the American position, and it ultimately triumphed. But the British never fully reconciled with it. Many times they officially agreed with us, um, but immediately began some machinations that negated our victory. By December 1943, it was clear that this was not a mere conjecture, but that these were the facts. Everything confirmed it. This was the kind of war that was going on between us and the British. An American officer in London naturally asked himself the question, why are the British so lucky in this war? On all material items, items, manpower, money, military equipment, we were the main partners, and at allied conferences, our point of view always won. So why couldn't we Americans get the decisions made to be implemented? In general terms, the answer was that in the struggle between the strength, energy and ignorance of youth, on the one hand and the intelligence, experience and stubbornness of old age, on the other, old age often wins, we were paying for our youth. Our task required close cooperation with a foreign power and we were totally unprepared for it. 
not just us Johnny newbies, but all Americans at home and abroad. The Americans were more versed in military science than their English counterparts, but complete inept at diplomacy, parliamentary procedure, and argument. We were helpless in debates with the English. Many had seen them for the first time in their lives, and the English were not like us Americans and did things in their own way, not like us. Meanwhile, our English colleagues had a significant contingent of military and civilian personnel with international political experience, from among whom they recruited a team to play us. They were accustomed to dealing with foreigners and knew how to get their way. In their own empire, as, for example, 104 with Canadians and Australians, as well as with foreigners outside the empire, they had centuries of experience behind them. We, on the other hand, had essentially none. But the British had more specific advantages over us. In my opinion, their most important advantage was control over the information on which decisions were made. Decisions at historical conferences depended entirely on information. We could not compete with the British, firstly, in the presentation of material, and secondly, and much more importantly, in the provision of primary source information and its analysis. Warfare requires two kinds of information, information about the enemy and information about one's own resources. In everything that concerned the European theater of war, the British had a 100 impenetrable, hermetically sealed monopoly on enemy intelligence. This monopoly was officially recognized at one of the first conferences of the Council of Chiefs of General Staff. By the decision of the conference, the responsibility for enemy intelligence in Europe rested solely with the British. How many divisions do the Germans have? What is their strength? What is their combat capability in a given case? How many tanks does Germany produce? How many airplanes does it produce per month? Where are the active airfields located? What are Germany's oil reserves? Is General von Kluge a talented general? What is the German line of fortifications on the Atlantic coast? In all these questions, the only authority was the British. They were the only and unquestionable authority because of our military intelligence on the continent and not worth talking about. And the British had such intelligence and an exemplary. There were, in addition, known areas of British intelligence where we had no access at all. This was not disseminated, and a direct question 105 the British always denied it, but I categorically assert that among the British circulated documents marked only known to them with a vulture, for English officers only. English intelligence was guided by the sound and witty principle that the best way to keep a secret is to reveal it 90%, and in such a way that your opponents think they know everything. When your opponents think they know everything, they can easily be persuaded to settle down on that, be satisfied with what they have, and not pester again. That's the principle they applied to us. They didn't hide anything from us, us on the face of it. In fact, they kept a fair amount of information to themselves, and only selected British officers had access to it. Intelligence has always been the main trump card of the British Empire. When things were so bad for the British, they were saved by the British Intelligence Service. After Dunkirk, England existed only at the expense of sleight of hand, hiding its weakness from the Germans, skillfully bluffing insignificant forces. All this she owed to the skill of British counterintelligence, undoubtedly the most active of the main departments of the British General Staff. Having a monopoly on information, the British did not cost anything, especially at the beginning of our work together, to deduce from any military equation of their desired answer. Everything depended on the importance they attached to the most essential of the unknowns of the equation, the capabilities of the enemy and its intentions. For example, throughout the war, British intelligence systematically downplayed the productive capacity of Germany, and thus with the support of the American Air Command defended the view that the invasion of France 106 in some necessary, the bombing of German cities, suits will force Germany to its knees. The most outstanding contribution to the military archives can be considered a fantastic plan known as Rankin, the author of which was one of the strategists Cossack. This plan envisioned an advance deep into Germany in the event of its sudden collapse. A month after the final 
expedition to cross the Channel was made in Washington, Cossack strategists submitted a written report. Of course, based solely on information from British intelligence, that the collapse of Germany should be expected any day now and therefore should pay more attention to Rankin than to Overlord. British intelligence not only downplayed the ability of Germany to wage war, but thwarted the invasion plan also by exaggerating the power of German fortifications on the French side of the Channel. German generals taken prisoner at the end of the war characterized our then current assessment of German coastal fortifications as a victory for German propaganda. It was not until after the American army had spent many months fighting in France that it began to establish an organization that could supply its command with information about the enemy based on its own sources. But at that time, not only the entire work of the Allied conferences, but all decisions concerning the European theater that were made between conferences depended on British intelligence. As far as the combined resources of the Allies were concerned, the British had the same absolute monopoly of information as to their contribution to the common cause their resources and capabilities. They established the rule that their assessment of their own capabilities was non-negotiable. In other words, if the British declared that they could field 107 by such and such a date 12 divisions, and not one more, then it was over. We could consider that by regrouping their forces. The British would be able to increase the army of the metropolis at the expense of garrisons in remote parts of the empire. If the Americans expressed this idea, the conversation was short. It was a private matter for them. The same situation occurred at the beginning of the war, when they wished to concentrate in England fighter aircraft to the detriment of the Mediterranean theatre, or to abandon daytime bombing in favour of night bombing, for which they completely reorganised the training of their flight personnel and redesigned production programmes. This state of affairs gave the British absolute control over three-quarters of all the information on which joint, allied strategic decisions were based. They controlled all the information on the enemy plus half the information on the Allies, while the British assessment of their own military strength was considered indisputable. The British reserved the right to challenge our assessments of our capabilities. They claimed this right on the basis of greater experience, and they were getting it right at least as far as assessments of U.S. land forces and air capabilities were concerned. The American Navy tended to regard this as its own business. It should not be thought that the British, sitting against us at the conference table, told us, you have and this you don't, this you can and this you can't. Instead, they exercised their recognized right to prove, to argue, to persuade, but in the litigation over day and night bombings, they did not stop there. First they tried to persuade us to agree with their night program, then began to persuade us to conduct along with day and night bombing, and finally, seeing that Arnold continues to hold firmly to his opinion on the effectiveness of daytime raids on Germany, they made an attempt to bypass him. An officer was sent to America with a specially selected series of photographs to influence the office of Roosevelt, as well as his wife and friends who can influence the president to force him to reverse the decision of his chief of staff. It was customary among some of America's top offices to accuse Roosevelt of betrayal every time we failed to insist. Conservative sentiment, quite widespread in the highest military circles of the United States, created distrust of Roosevelt. The initiator of the new course, and in these circles prevailed the belief that Churchill trembled President of the United States like a small child. All the facts show otherwise. Let us remember the advantages which the British had over the Americans. In their hands they had control over the factual material that served as the basis for their decisions, the position of veterans who had made many sacrifices on the altar of war and had learned military wisdom in the school of harsh experience, filled them with a sense of moral and spiritual superiority over their partners. Taking all this into account, I wonder not that Roosevelt enjoyed insufficient prestige, but that this prestige was so great. Now we come close to the chapter on personalities. Roosevelt, even before he agreed to the creation of the Council of British and American Chiefs of General Staff as a single body, made his own decision on how he would fight the war that history had forced upon him.
he decided to choose his military advisers at once and to stand behind them. He entrusted 109 Supreme Command to men who had never, as yet, led a battle in World War II. He gave them carte blanche, being contentatively, groping for his commanders in the Civil War. Wilson's generals came to a cap in the hat. The British and French had fought too long without them, and Pershing's army had neither experience nor equipment a killery it had to borrow, and its own aviation, and did not even have. But Roosevelt chose Marshal Arnold and King, once and for all gave them his trust, and no one, neither in America nor abroad, not allowed to criticize their action. It is said that Admiral King, in opening the first meeting of the Council of Chiefs of Staff, stated bluntly that he had served under British command in that war and wished to make it clear that it would not happen again to him or to any of his ships. The British had been looking for several years for a means to discredit King or to persuade Roosevelt to replace him with a more malleable chief of naval staff. Roosevelt never once wavered, either in his confidence or in his disposition toward King. Clashes between General Arnold and the command of King's Air Force began soon after America's entry into the war. Namely, you as I have already mentioned, over the question of whether targeted bombing was possible in daylight raids on Germany. The British were pulling all sorts of tricks to somehow persuade Roosevelt against General Arnold to rearm and retrain our heavy bomber air force for night raids so that it could be incorporated into the British Air Force, which had switched to night bombing after daylight raids on Germany became too expensive. Arnold did not relent and introduced a new type of long-range fighters to escort 110 flying fortresses to the combat mission. In addition, he defended the autonomy of the American Air Force in England. In all his actions, he consistently enjoyed the full support of Roosevelt. Marshall's behavior was less clear. There is no doubt that, as Hopkins said, Marshall discussed land force matters with Churchill as an equal with an equal, not unlike other generals in both the American and British armies, but somehow he was less vigilant and less assertive in arguing the point of view of the American ground forces than Arnold and King were when it came to the Navy and Air Force. Perhaps this is because Marshall, a typical example of a good American career officer, was honest, persistent, deeply patriotic, but also somewhat limited and naive, and refused to believe that anyone he knew personally could be snippy with him, be that as it may. Marshall was nowhere near as sharp as Arnold and King in seeing all the loopholes in our mixed enterprise by which one partner could gain the upper hand over the other not in open dispute face to face at the boardroom table, but by other means. Let's face it, Marshall was often disregarded. Anyway, everything suggests that Marshall felt only some embarrassment and slight annoyance, watching the course of events in 1942 and 1943, and seeing that the main military efforts of the Allied forces in Europe are systematically directed to the Mediterranean theatre of operations, and always now after Roosevelt was able to agree on the direction of the main blow across the channel. That Marshall, as predicted by Hopkins, himself assumed a post of Allied Commander-in-Chief, the subsequent chapters of the story of the conquest of Europe might have looked very different. Face to face with his opponents, Marshall did not give up his position, but a different man occupied that post. And of him there will be a special discussion, for which it is necessary to go back and cast a last cursory glance at the campaign which began our march across the Atlantic. Eisenhower's story begins with the invasion of Africa and the defeat of the Germans in Tunisia. To this time also belongs the emergence of the Council of Chiefs of General Staff. The Council of Chiefs of General Staff, composed of the Chiefs of Staff of the three branches of the armed forces, of both countries and working closely with the heads of state, was one thing. The Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Active Forces was another. From the very beginning of the game, the British considered the Joint Anglo-American Command as the best means of remaining masters of the situation and compensate or counterbalance the threateningly growing power of their ally. It was clear that if the British generals wanted to take the lead, and that is what the British wanted, Concessions would have to be made to American public opinion. 
After all, the Americans were supplying soldiers and military equipment and even paying their allies' bills. And the most favourable concession, which would have the greatest effect with the least expenditure of authority, is to give an American the highest command post and push him to the top, as American businessmen say when they put an undesirable director as chairman of the board. But there was also a job for the chairman of the board, to settle in case of failure to be a scapegoat all sorts of sensitive political situations. The convenience of having a ceremonial commander-in-chief found already in North Africa, where Generals Alexander and Montgomery ran the military affairs, and the Allied commander-in-chief, 112 American Eisenhower, was in charge of the political kitchen. At this stage of the game of the British Empire was almost indifferent which of the American generals comes to the forefront. The British probably thought at the time that they would still have time to select some of the American candidates for greater responsibility. That was yet to come. In the midst of the confusion and confusion in the command on the African front, when the Americans were changing combat commanders every week, and the troops were untrained and unreliable, Eisenhower, having handed the reins to Alexander, was busy justifying his actions to the ambitious American generals at the front and the U.S. War Department. He also did not forget about the press and made sure that everything looked right in the papers. Throughout the African campaign, Eisenhower fiddled with the French. De Gaulle, Girard and Darlan, these three consecutive nightmares, the British kindly left it to him. When he succeeded in clearing up this mess without irreparable scandal, his career was assured. The British, who had hitherto treated Eisenhower very discreetly, now began to openly favour him, put it in the first place in the army and at meetings of the chiefs of general staff, and in those confidential conversations where one word can and elevate and destroy a public figure. Needless to say, the British found the right man. As a diplomat, Eisenhower willingly took responsibility and was able to get out of difficulties. As a soldier, do not interfere in other people's business. He was cool enough to pull back some pattern for excessive assertiveness in the fight for the autonomy of the American command. He knew how to be very sharp with his subordinates. 130. He was ready to defend the idea of a joint Anglo-American headquarters, in spite of the unanimous opposition of American commanders, who had already driven troops into battle under a unified command and considered such a system cumbersome and ineffective. And since he was good with Marshall, he championed the idea. Marshall, separated from Eisenhower by 3,000 miles, relied on him for everything. But at the front, Eisenhower began to gradually distance himself from his associates in the U.S. Army and started his own small staff, headed by his own chief of staff, Bedell Smith. He became a general from politics. This is not a prejudice or an anticipation of future events. This was the general situation in Africa, with the British firmly in the saddle and a firm grip on the reins, and Eisenhower, like all American frontline generals, was uncertain and inexperienced. Like any American commander, he was groping for his place in the common cause, trying to guess what Marshall expected of him, and to adapt to the alien world in which he had found himself, and where he had to prove himself. Eisenhower stood out among the American generals of his calculating and complete indifference to everything that did not belong to his direct duties. To serve both Marshall and these strange, incomprehensible Englishmen who made his career, other American generals were fascinated by combat, concerned with prejudice or personal attachments. Eisenhower, without hesitation, reaped the benefits of other people's combat successes. No feelings did not bother him, and he always tried to put on the right card. So in Eisenhower, the British found the right man to resolve difficult political situations and to curb two assertive American combat generals. In addition, so to speak, for the same money, the British acquired a tolerable administrator, not a tenured 14 mortal, cannot successfully lead the joint staff, an unusually malleable partner, Eisenhower was a born mediator and peacemaker. At that time, he even said of himself that he was by nature not a general, but a businessman. After assuming the title of Supreme Commander in the Mediterranean Theatre, Eisenhower gave Field Marshal Alexander Alex. 
military leadership of the entire Tunisian campaign. When the invasion of Sicily began, Eisenhower again gave the American Chiefs of General Staff a fight for the resources the British needed to continue the rocky road to the Balkans, even though again the decision was made to direct the main effort to an invasion across the English Channel, and again he won the battle for them. Thus, by the time of the Tehran Conference, Eisenhower, already battle-tested at the conference table, was logically the British Empire's first candidate. And the British did indeed put him in the post of Allied Supreme Commander in England. In London, it was firmly expected that he would repeat his Mediterranean number. He would take over politics, give military leadership to more experienced generals, and himself would accept awards and promotions in the public eye. Omar Bradley's story also begins in Africa. It begins with the American defeat in the battle for the Kasserine Mountain Pass. The landing in Africa was, militarily speaking, a problematic victory over a problematic enemy, but it was a true triumph of organization, a triumph of accurate calculation and precise execution in the midst of a complex naval operation that required the transfer of an entire army for many thousands of miles. Ending in Africa, in addition, was a masterpiece of sleight of Han. The entire campaign was masterfully disguised, its goals carefully obscured at twelve. In the first week, taking advantage of the confusion of the enemy caught unawares, the Allied troops came within a few miles of the port of Bizerte and almost occupied it. They even reached the hill in sight of the city, but here they lacked ammunition and fuel. If they had occupied the port of Bizerte, 116 Rommel's supply line would have been cut cleanly in one blow. When the Germans came to their senses and began to push their way to retreat, Rommel withdrew from Montgomery, skirting the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. They ran into the extreme, too far advanced American columns, and our untrained soldiers in disarray retreated to 60 miles and after the first skirmish enemy fire almost ceased. Later the Americans repulsed the Kasserine Mountain Pass and prevented the Germans from passing through it and defeating our field stores. So little later, the Americans, having gained strength and experience, already held the flank, while Montgomery moved along the Tunisian coast and later held an exemplary organized maneuver. Relying on their old positions, broke through the mountains and defeated surrounded in Tunisia Germans. Of the 150,000 captured Germans, most were captured by the Americans. Bradley's story begins with the defeat at the Kasserine Mountain Pass, although he was not there and did not even hold a command position. It was only during the African campaign that U.S. Army headquarters began to look for combat commanders capable of winning battles. American ground forces had not fought on the continent in over 20 years, and it was not known which generals could be trusted. At the Battle of Kasserine, the first shot belonged to Fredendall, and he missed. Second in line, a certain Harmon, Patton in miniature and also commander of tank troops, equalized the score 117 in the second half. Then Patton entered the game, and the Germans beat him. Prior to this in landing operations, Patton showed himself at his best. His I.I. Corps took El Geta and repelled a counterattack of German tanks. But his British superiors ordered him not to build on his success. He was not allowed to go to the coast, from which he was separated from only 30-mile march through the desert, because it was necessary to miss Montgomery's army. When they calculated the results of the African competition, it turned out that Patton did not reach the points. Then the U.S. Army decided to try another player. Bradley, who before the war was a schoolteacher, he looked like a good guy. In a final decisive breakthrough, Bradley put the ball in the goal. At the time, Bradley was lower in rank than Patton the 13. Clark, Devers and a dozen other candidates for the highest position in the command of the American active army. But he did his job so well and did it so calmly and unobtrusively that when the invasion of Sicily began, Marshall and Eisenhower again put him in command, and again he won the game. No one now challenged his right to be admitted to the upcoming drawing of the grand prize, 
and the command of one of the armies in France was secured for him even before the appointments decided in Tehran. Bradley's victories on the Mediterranean front are interesting in that by them, one could already foresee what kind of army commander he would make in France. In Africa, he is first success 118, was due to the fact that he was able to raise the spirit of the most unreliable American units. For this purpose, he deliberately sent them to small battles of local importance, where they were ensured an easy victory, having achieved by such tactics to improve the morale of the troops. He gave his infantry the order to march and took the famous Height 609 and other hills, the names of which made headlines, and left the rest to Harman's tanks. Harman rushed so swiftly into the German sack that he didn't even stop to pick up a German headquarters he caught on the way. When the Nazi generals finally caught up with him to surrender, Harman uttered the classic line, Damn it! Unconditional surrender is painfully cheap. The entire plan and leadership in this operation belonged to Bradley, but it was over so quickly and Alexander and Eisenhower gave Montgomery and his Eighth Army such a lion's share of the credit that it went almost unnoticed. Of all the armies in action, the world knew only one the illustrious British Eighth Army, which changed the course of the war at El Alain and chased Rommel from Egypt itself, without in any way detracting from the fighting merits of the Eighth Army. I want to remind that the American infantry broke through the mountains and tank units Bradley entered the breakthrough and defeated the enemy. In Sicily, Bradley was basically carrying out British plans. It was a combined operation under a combined command, with Alexander and Montgomery in command on the pair. Bradley landed on the left flank, Montgomery on the right flank. Montgomery was to take a shortcut directly to the Straits of Messina. Bradley had to wide bypass movement to cover the entire centre of the island. Bradley's troops so brilliantly executed the assigned part of the plan that no one could no longer 119 doubt the fighting qualities of Bradley and his troops, although formerly Bradley was still just a corps commander at Patton. Bradley met Montgomery in Tunisia, but there they fought at opposite ends of the German sack. In Sicily, they were separated from each other only by the so-called dividing line at the junction of the flanks of the two armies. Their first encounters in the common cause could not be called happy. Montgomery's flank was delayed while the Americans advanced, and one of Bradley's columns almost occupied an important junction in the central part of the island. But, by order of Alexander, who granted Montgomery's request, was stopped for the town in question was intended for Monty. The commander of the American column waited two days on the outskirts, after which Bradley still permitted him to enter the town. As the British generals are very jealous of the ownership of military objects, an unpleasant conversation took place, but then the full capture of Sicily ended. The American tanks, having made a long detour, reached the Straits of Messina almost simultaneously with the Eighth Army, advancing the shortest route along the coast, already having in hand orders. To prepare to take command in France, Bradley immediately left, and his place in the Italian campaign took Mark Clark. On Bradley's left flank was Patton, and he commanded the tank troops that crossed Sicily to capture Palermo. After a day's hard push along the coast, they gassed up and cut through 90 miles of enemy territory. German and Italian garrisons were taken by surprise. Patton's throw is still considered one of the most successful privateering operations of the war. As a result of the Sicilian campaign, Patton's place in the European theatre was also secured. If only an invasion across the 120 English Channel was ever destined to materialise. Changes and movements in the American army operating in Africa, characteristic not only for the first stage of the war. The same tactics were followed by the U.S. War Department throughout the European campaign. The combat commander was required to show his face or bye-bye throughout the war, up to and after such brilliant victories as the Remagen Bridge. Battalion, regimental, divisional, and corps commanders were summarily removed not only for defeat in battle, but often even for not winning a battle quickly enough or completely enough. This tactic was unspoken because in the American army they prefer not to make a mess of things.
the severe exacting attitude toward combat commanders seems to evaporate when it reaches the corps commander. Army commanders and above are treated incomparably more leniently by the war ministry, probably on the principle that if a man is entrusted with the command of an army, he deserves it, and considering, incidentally, the undesirable effect on the morale of his subordinates or on the reputation of the master, which would have the effect of recognising that appointment to such a high post was a mistake. I think I personally know a dozen divisional and corps commanders who have shown themselves worthy to lead armies. It may seem unfair that so few active duty army commanders have a chance to be nominated, but we in Europe did not have many vacancies for the post of army commander. I personally am struck by the speed and determination with which the war ministry, amidst the confusion that characterized the beginning of the African campaign, managed to choose men who won victories in Tunisia and Sicily. 120 weeks before the Tehran conference, the Americans had outlined two candidates for the highest frontline command positions in Europe, and after the Tehran conference under pressure from the Russians, who demanded a final answer, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed that Eisenhower will take the post of the Allied Supreme Commander and appointed three British Commander-in-Chief, land, sea and air forces. Thus the command slid neatly into the groove hollowed out for that purpose in the Overlord, rolled smoothly through all official channels and fell directly into the hands of General and soon Sir Bernard Montgomery. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory and Admiral of the Navy Sir Bertrand Ramsey. The invasion in the north of Europe was again, theoretically, in the balance and it was to be carried out, according to the conceived plan, under all British leadership. The Tihara Conference was coming to an end, and meanwhile in England the Johnny Newsmen were finishing their work. Their days were numbered. In late December the Great Montgomery flew to England, and without even bothering to contact the American main headquarters, directly drove to the American troops in southern England, ordered them to pull together in the area of assembly and, standing at the microphone, announced that henceforth he commanded them. They looked at the little man with curiosity. He is very short in stature and wears thick-soled shoes to make himself appear taller. His small stature surprised them. He was usually photographed standing on some elevated position, which made him look more imposing and formidable. He was in his famous black barrette, very trim and alert. The amplifiers carried his high, almost shrill voice to everyone. He promised to bloody the Germans' noses, and the soldiers on whom that blood was to be splattered clapped politely. In January, Jackie Devers packed his belongings and left for Africa. Along with him departed his Chief of Staff David Barr, Chief of Staff Operations Daniel Noakes, and about 20 other officers, adjutants and other personnel. Meanwhile, Montgomery took up residence in his main apartment, called the 21st Army Group. It was located on the outskirts of London in the building of St. Paul's School, where Montgomery once studied, now in the auditorium sounded a continuous shuffling of feet. This is in and out of the participants of the meetings. General Bradley's army headquarters was in Bristol and Bradley had to second a whole group of officers to London specifically to participate in the many meetings of Montgomery. They were now called syndicates, a term adopted by the British planning system. When a matter is merely discussed, it is a committee meeting. But the preparation of a specific operation is a syndicate. Syndicates in London occurred as often and multiplied as quickly as committee meetings. Two other British commanders-in-chief. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory and Admiral of the Navy Sir Bertram Ramsey, as well as Monty, were coming within the rights of the inheritance bequeathed to them by Tehran. Then Eisenhower himself arrived, and the new Supreme Commander-in-Chief, this time no longer a household name, settled on the outskirts of London, where Ira Ica's 8th Air Force headquarters had once been. Their officers of many nations gathered under a camouflage net as large as the awning over the Barnum Bailey Circus. The picture was impressive. The 8th Air Army was living quite well, but the CAF felt that by its position it needed even better conditions. In the former headquarters of the 8th Air Army, like mushrooms after the rain, grew canteens, cafeterias, snack bars. 
among the first decisions of the Anglo-American command was an agreement that it would receive not British, but American rations, and its economy will be transferred to the American specialists. The ruler of this little empire was Eisenhower's chief of staff, Biddle Smith. Lady Tedder arrived from the Mediterranean theatre before her husband, and was very angry to learn that the most suitable residence next door to headquarters was already occupied for Ike, but she soon found equally satisfactory quarters for the deputy allied commander-in-chief. She was glad to be back in London, the Italians, she said, were an intolerable people. What she had suffered from them while in charge of the chief marshal's household. Having opened their salon, Eisenhower, Tedder, Biddell Smith and company soon ascended to the high spheres of international relations. For London had a large assortment of governments in exile, and now Eisenhower had to deal with their rights and privileges. Many of them even had their own amusement battalions, trained and equipped by the British. Each wanted, in one way or another, to participate in the liberation of their homeland. Selecting interpreters for the scafe was already a problem in itself. As Cossack had foreseen, working out a procedure for communicating with such a diverse society proved to be a very troublesome endeavour for the High Command. From the very make-up of the command, it appeared that the Supreme Commander should assign responsibility for the invasion to his three deputies. They began issuing orders, either signed by all three, or, if the matter involved only one branch of the military, signed by the respective Commander-in-Chief. American headquarters were dispersed, and the Americans as such, as a whole with a single point of view and a single line, ceased to exist. The American air units supporting the ground forces consolidated into the 9th Air Army, which soon gained fame for itself, were subordinated to Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Leigh Mallory. His headquarters settled on the lovely Sunningdale estate, an hour's drive from London, and on certain days reported to the Air Chief Marshal. Bradley, with his first army, as we have seen, remained in Bristol, and some of his planning staff was attached to the headquarters of the 21st Army Group. Grosvenor Square came under General John Lee of the Supply Service. Lee's headquarters continued to function, getting what Monty needed from America and coordinating supply matters with the appropriate British War Office personnel and Montgomery's headquarters. The American Long Range Air Force, formerly linked to the American Command through the personal relationship of the commanders, now operated on the sidelines under a new commander, General Dolittle. In short, American forces were dismembered and scattered like an army defeated in battle. The most neglected of the American headquarters was the poor, forgotten Fusag. This was the headquarters organized by Divas to run the American army group should one ever come into existence. There was no commander, and it was run by a chief of staff, one after Tehran, this organization was entrusted to Bradley himself as an additional burden to the command of the First Army. At this time, the First United States Army was called Fuser for short, and this created tremendous confusion, especially since Fuser and Fuser came under the command of the same person. When Bradley took command of this army group in France, it was partly to eliminate confusion, partly for security reasons. Referred to as the Twelfth Army Group, and the use of the abbreviated name was forbidden. In all likelihood, at the time of Bradley's appointment as commander of FUSAG, the US War Department had not yet decided whether he would remain in that position when FUSAG began to exercise command functions, if at all. It is possible that in his haste, Marshall simply enlisted Bradley for both posts, believing that when the time came the group could be turned over to some suitably ranked general. Washington had generals in high rank, McNair, who directed the training of the Army Lear and several others, while Bradley was second in rank even to Patton. The fact that Bradley was of comparatively low rank should be remembered, for it influenced subsequent events. Be that as it may, Bradley's first appearance at Fusac was not as a commander, but as a tourist. From Bristol to Normandy and beyond, he considered himself first and foremost an army commander. In the winter of 1944, the headquarters of the army group through which Bradley later commanded four armies in France, lived a modest and inconspicuous existence in Bryanston Square, in a poor neighbourhood near Grosvenor and Mayfair. 
Modest is the right expression, but inconspicuous is not an accurate epithet. Within a month after the organization of the FUSAG, the mention of it was already causing as much laughter in London as the funniest numbers in a New York music hall. For the FUSAG had no troops, no definite task, and, as it seemed at the time, the jokes came mainly from the British headquarters, which did not want to see an American competitor around them, and it was understandable. But it must be said that the officers of the FUSAG, as if on purpose, supplied the material for such jokes. In London, their main contribution to the war effort was an excellent mess hall. The staff was a peculiar mixture of veterans, finally arrived from Africa, and newcomers, fresh from the States. The latter set the tone. They were fussing over a thousand unnecessary trifles and were particularly keen on the problem of how to toughen up for the coming camping life. No one was willing to give them a piece of English land to camp on. And then, after much deliberation, they made a great decision. Along the whole of Bryanston Square stretches a wide avenue bordered with beautiful tall trees. One day Fusag solemnly floated out from his residence, pitched his tents under these trees, and there fed himself a breakfast. After breakfast all returned to their apartments and offices. Poor Fusag. The most upsetting incident for him occurred in March, when the Germans made their last attempt to burn London from the air. They had to drop their incendiary bombs right on the roof of the Fusag. On all the neighbouring rooftops were on duty the glorified London Air Defence Service, who vividly handled their incendiaries. But on the attics of the Fusag, no one put them out. The British, of course, did not serve these houses, and the Fusag had not yet reached the hands of measures to combat air raids. Thus, the lighters burned the headquarters post office, part of the archive, the commandant's office and some other little things. It turned out to be a very beautiful bonfire, against which the marvellous trees stood out spectacularly, and firefighting undoubtedly enriched the combat experience of the Fusag. The raid from which the Fusag suffered had some bearing on me, for I was at this time living in a small apartment in an alleyway just off Bryanston Square. The raids were not new to me. I had lived through the Blitz of 1940, I liked to watch them, and usually, as soon as the anti-aircraft guns started firing, I would lean out of the window to see what was going on in the world. It happened that on the eve of the raid in question, I spent half an hour reading materials on the survey of German pilots captured during the last raid. It was clear from the interviews that the Germans were trying to use against London a new bombing technique borrowed from the British. I decided to check it out. The prisoners reported that the first German planes should drop signals in a certain order, one row perpendicular to the course to mark the line of exit on a combat course, then the second along the course, indicating the direction to the target, and finally directly above the target, the lead plane will drop a very bright red rocket. It will indicate the place where subsequent waves of planes should drop their bombs, the object for the night. On the night of the Fusag raid, no sooner had I stuck my head out the window than I saw with my own eyes everything I'd had read about. These lights marked the line of departure on a combat course. Here are the signals flying along the bombing line. I stared as if mesmerized. It was as if I were watching a play I had just finished. And then I bent down and looked up and found that a beautiful red rocket on a parachute, in which I recognized the object pointer, was hovering just over my head. Two seconds later, the air was filled with rustling and whistling, and the lighters slammed into the rooftops and sidewalks like raindrops. Switching from my academic study of German raid techniques to the more practical task of getting out of my alley alive, it was only then that I saw that the Fusag was on fire. One of the reasons why I was reading the POW surveys that winter was the intelligence we had received about the Germans' intention to use some secret weapon against England. We knew that they were making both airplane shells and stratospheric missiles, and our plans included, among other things, the evacuation of London. It was to affect only the civilian population. The government and headquarters were supposed to hide underground to a depth of at least 60 feet and do not move anywhere, so as not to shake morale in the country 
and not give the Germans an excuse to say that they destroyed London as a functioning centre of the British Empire. The first thing I learned about the bombing planes was the following. Explosives in quantities equal to the cargo of a freight car would be dropped on London every two minutes around the clock, day after day. This was thought to be the maximum that we would be threatened with by airplane shells if they were to be launched from all along the coast from Holland to Cherbourg, as was suggested. Soon the photos delivered by our reconnaissance planes showed the launching stations, strips pointed in the shape of a ski. I remember it well because, on that basis, we, all that was left of Deva's headquarters, made a last-ditch effort to get someone to hurry up the invasion. It seemed to us that the best way to save London from further air trouble was to cross the channel and take away the Germans' bases. Credit must be given to the courage and restraint of the British. The very real threat of national disaster, encapsulated in the airplane shells and rockets, never once shook the British officers, firmly determined that nothing will not make them hurry up and do not distract from the intended course and plans. It should not be thought that they underestimated or ignored the dangers of the dive-bombing planes. Soon all Allied strategic air, raid plans were rearranged to curb this evil. British scientists worked day and night, but could not offer the government any real countermeasures. And the British did not want to hurry. At that time, as far as I remember, I was only half of the fusag. Devers, leaving for one reason or another left some of us in England, and the little planning work that the Americans could still do, was carried out by his former staff and later organised by the headquarters of the army group. When the pointlessness of making plans in the absence of an army to carry them out became too obvious, the Fusig set up a sort of vanguard and temporarily attached it to the headquarters of the British commander-in-chief. Theoretically, the task of this group was to familiarise itself with Montgomery's operations so that by the time the reorganisation occurred, when American ground forces passed from Montgomery's command to the American commander, at least a few American officers would be aware of army group-wide operations and would ensure a more or less seamless transition and continuity of strategic and tactical plans. In mid-March I was included in this group, and when Montgomery and his staff moved from St. Paul's to the vicinity of Portsmouth, I followed him. We camped on the lawns and under the trees of the beautiful Southwick Park estate. Thus another American group was formed. At Portsmouth we had an opportunity to become intimately acquainted with Montgomery's plans, but to discuss them with other Americans we had to either return to London or undertake the eight-hour automobile trip to Bristol. We were what civilian conferences once called voiceless observers, and there was no one to listen to our voices. However, the reception we received at Montgomery's headquarters was to our liking. For many months of working with the British, our position had remained ambiguous, but now at least we knew our place. Nashish Taba Montgomery, Freddy de Gingand, gathered twenty to thirty of our group in a large tent and made a speech of roughly this content. General Montgomery has instructed me to tell you that he is very glad to see you here. He would like you to realise that this headquarters is not an Anglo-American headquarters. This is British headquarters. You will have no rights and no duties here. However, we intend to tell you everything we know and cooperate with you in every way. As far as I understand, your task is to keep abreast of General Montgomery's operations, to know what steps he is planning and how he intends to implement them. We will do everything we can to help you get that information. But the matter is our business, and we think it will be less trouble if everyone understands it. It was clear, and that pleased us, as if a refreshing gulp of lemon juice washed away the stale taste of all these. Your hand overseas, friends. Well done, honestly. But don't you think another thing was encouraging? It seemed that Montgomery had decided to take the invasion seriously, and we had long ago stopped worrying about who would move the matter forward as long as it moved forward. But we were now relieved of the agonising doubt as to whether we had been right in imposing our untried ideas on the English veterans. Johnny knew guys would have a hard time in 1943, even if their only concern was following orders. Orders to prepare for a military operation that their allies didn't seem to think was necessary. 
But even more disconcerting and deeply depressing was the feeling that they were not entitled to any views at all. They were sure that it was possible to prepare this operation and that with proper preparation it would be successful. But were they entitled to such confidence? After all, they were essentially proceeding on theory alone. The most experienced of them only participated in skirmishes with the Germans in Africa. They did not have to, as the British commandos, to cross the English Channel on landing craft, to land among mines and barbed wire, under the fire of concrete fortifications. They knew that by insisting on their unenlightened opinions, they were jeopardizing hundreds of thousands of lives and history itself. They had no confidence, no experience or knowledge on which to base their arguments. In difficult moments, with pure American spontaneity and optimism, they could only believe in themselves and in their countrymen. Their more experienced allies had no difficulty in suggesting to them that they understood nothing. We knew that if we made a mistake, someone would pay for our blunder with blood. Now that the great Montgomery had taken command, we were all relieved. The terrible burden of responsibility was no longer weighing on our shoulders. We got on well with our new friends, living and eating with them together in tents under the old oaks. For the first time we were working with a group of Englishmen who we respected for their military services and among whom we occupied a certain clearly defined position. This is where the saying was justified, the stronger the fence, the better the neighbours. In the evenings we sometimes talked on these subjects with our English colleagues, sharing opinions about the men who were to lead our armies on the march. Some of Montgomery's colonels had served in Africa with American troops and under American headquarters. They said to us, as if justifying themselves, but you have no commanders at all. Remember how long it took us to find Montgomery, and you had just started the war. They called Montgomery our chief and believed in him unwaveringly. Wait till you see him in action, they said to us. The meaning of their words was that although we had good material, they liked Bradley and Harmon, for example. We would have to play the role of the masses, and the British would lead us to victory, and they really thought so. We could only contrast this with the modest achievements of our commanders in Africa and Sicily, so we asked them, If your chief made a name for himself at El Amame, does it follow that the Americans do not need to put forward their combat commanders? Does in charge intend to supply the Allies henceforth with all the commanders needed for victory? And if they admit the idea that the Allied cause will still require senior American commanders, for the time is not far distant when the American forces will outnumber the British by a factor of five few. What then if this theory prevails and no American commander is given the opportunity to gain experience and prove himself in a sufficiently high position? Would it really be one Monty to the end? The British shrugged their shoulders. And why not? Monty and Alexander, they firmly believed that it is only to perform overlord and clear in France, the place where the main could turn around, and the enemy is dead, who is appointed commander of German troops in northwest France, Rommel, and with Rommel chief knows how to manage. We marveled at their confidence, but did not dare to object. After all, in Africa they did not fail, but at first Montgomery did not meet our expectations, no sooner had he settled in England than he decided to postpone the invasion, agreed in Tehran. A whole month, we shudder. One more such postponement, and the invasion is automatically postponed until next year. In the plan overlord, one thing was indisputable. The invasion must be carried out in such a way that the whole summer remained ahead. The British were scared to death of fall storms in the English Channel and in essence in Montgomery's order was nothing comforting. Not that he moved the invasion from the first suitable tide in May to the first suitable tide in June. No, he simply pushed it back to May 31, a date clearly taken from the descendant because it fell exactly one week earlier than the desired phase of the moon and the tide. It was clear that the purpose of this move was to honour the letter of the Tehran Agreement and not to care about its meaning. The Russians first insisted on April 1, and then dropped April to guarantee the beginning of May. When we asked the British whether the Russians had been notified of the postponement, they, to our surprise, replied in the negative. 
Later, a special mission was sent to Moscow with this news, but it did not leave until after the discussion of dates had already lost all meaning. Still, we didn't know what to think of Montgomery. By delaying the deadline, he was at the same time pushing for the expansion of operations that many Americans had fought for so long and unsuccessfully. Like under Devers, the American commander-in-chief had given his planners the task of expanding Overlord. They chose a strip of coast to the right of the originally intended landing area, and the entire operation was worked out on paper accordingly. Bradley returned to these plans as soon as he took office, and they were thoroughly refined. The new stretch of coast came on the American flank, which fully justified Bradley's measures, although it was not within his power to carry out these plans. It was Montgomery who now demanded the widening of the front and got his way, for no one challenged his authority. Unlike Devers, he was spared the necessity of bargaining. Even the Saif was subordinate to the chief, by virtue of the authority given to him under the Tehran Agreement. In the winter of 1944, an unprecedented phenomenon took ply. The junior staff would summon the senior staff of the senior staff and lecture them on what to do next and how to do it. I was present at one such interview and witnessed for myself Chief of Staff, Monty berating the generals from the scaife. Montgomery's officers had the authority to sign orders on his behalf and once even gave the Foreign Office a scolding. They issued a historic order that diplomatic mail to neutral countries be suspended in the interest of security, but that belongs to a later time. In January we experienced moments of despondency over the postponement, and then the meetings increased in frequency to the point where we began to fear lest the whole operation might be buried under them. Later, Chief of the American General Staff Marshal spoke in his official report about the squalor that prevailed in London in January. Eisenhower wrote to him at the time, It is quite clear that energetic steps must be taken here in several directions. Location of headquarters, a clear arrangement of commanders, the tactics of the assault, the number of troops and the amount of equipment. All these issues have not yet been resolved definitively. The most important of all tasks is to strengthen the first attacking wave in the Overlord. The main sticking point, especially after the invasion plan was finally expanded, remained the watercraft. We have only now learned that the British have made another foolishness in the Mediterranean Sea. In Churchill's mind, it was decided again at the very last time, it was decided to land a landing with the aim of capturing Rome. For this purpose it was intended, of course, to use transport ships, which would greatly help to solve all the difficulties in the English Channel. The unfortunate Mediterranean Front, now transferred to the exclusive control of the British, again became our crossroads. We, being in England, at that time did not know that the troops would be landed at Anzio, and that after the failure of this operation, the race to the Balkans will cease. After Ranzio, there was no hope of winning the war from the Mediterranean Sea. There were airplane shells, the war dragged on, and the British, firmly in their hands command, consoled by the fact that if the invasion across the Channel will not pass, they at least, they can conduct the war in their own way. We in Portsmouth only felt that by the end of February and the February, and the landing at Anzio began on January 22, the prospects of the operation in the Channel mysteriously became clearer. Preparations for the assault began in earnest, for everything that could be late was already unacceptably late. This is when the Johnny newbies, it turned out that they, these uninvited helpers, were doing the right thing. Despite all the obstacles, they'd had managed to bring the work to the point from which it could now be continued. The assault training centre had developed the techniques of the first assault echelon. Without anyone's authorization, its basic principles were worked out and the training of American troops began. Montgomery had only to legalise it all. Landing ships, which could give us the Mediterranean fleet, firmly stuck at Anzio. But on the instructions of the staff Devers, Working in contact with Donald Nelson, the American shipyards were already building new ships, and they were in time to meet the deadline. In addition, the Johnny rookies, even before leaving, after much effort, still managed to convince the American fleet to take the problem of invasion seriously. 
when it became clear that increased ship firepower would be needed to cover the assault on its increased scale. The American Navy offered its services. The supply organization, which Devers chipped and left in England, worked smoothly, was already going to starve the warehouses. It is also significant that in the American supply organization was enough former Johnny Newby, thoroughly studied the workers and practices of supply and transportation in the United Kingdom. Without their skill, it would have been difficult to see this work through to complete. All these not inconsiderable achievements were the direct result of the work of Devers and Code in the face of incessant opposition from their allies. They may not have been privy to the secret of the game, but they knew how to hit the ball. It is even possible that Devers and his assistants would not have done more if the purpose of their work had been clearer to them. Their weapon in the fight was their manner of taking all English arguments, literally. They simply wore out the English with their primitive logic. How can we train troops if we have no training ground? England has millions of acres of land, and we only need a few hundred. Why are they not given to us? Such persistence, bordering on childishness, was having an effect. Preparations for the operation began to take visible shape as troop concentrations and rehearsals began. The previous summer, the strategic air forces were tasked to break the Luftwaffe by bombing aircraft factories and imposing air battles. This task had been entrusted to Iker's 8th Air Army, now commanded by Doolittle rather than to the British Air Force, because British bombers were still used only for night missions, during which there was no opportunity either to accurately sight the desired industrial site or to engage in combat to destroy enemy fighter pilots. Doolittle's targeted bombers, covered by long-range fighters, now engaged German aircraft closely. Throughout the winter of 1944, the newspapers did not say a word about the fact that the beginning of the battle for Europe was approaching. The Allies hoped that when the invasion began, the Germans would take it as a powerful attack against the launching stations for airborne dive bombers, the preparation of which, as the Germans knew, we had knowledge. Early in January, the 8th Air Army was reinforced by the 15th, American long-range bombers from Italy, and merged with them into a single strike force under General Spanatz for action over the continent. In February, the raids reached a high point. General Marshall wrote, the brutal battle lasted a whole week. It was fought over Regensburg, Mersburg, Schweinfurt and other important industrial centres. German fighter aviation was severely weakened, our attacks continued with unrelenting fury, and yet we feared that the British would not take advantage of the loopholes available in the plan Overlord. Again, we did not know that after Anzio, they were forced to abandon their intention to get to the Balkans first. But by April, Overlord had already developed an irresistible force of inertia. The machine was already working, and everyone knew it. No loopholes, no high... Politics and pious aspirations could now prevent the invasion of Europe. The whole vast machinery of it had reached such a size and such a force that the impossibility of stopping it was obvious to everyone. The troops pulled into England in 1942 were not so numerous. They could easily be transferred to Africa. Another thing, Overlord, now no longer hundreds of thousands, but millions lined up in queues at the boarding points on the ships. These queues stretched across England and Scotland and further, across the ocean, to overcrowded camps behind the ports of the Atlantic coast of the United States. Along the same path from American factories and mines moved supplies. Everything was ready. Everything was set up with the sole purpose of reaching the European mainland across the English Channel. There was no man or group of men, no government to block this flow. The invasion lived its own peculiar life. As a whole, it was of immeasurably greater importance than any of its constituent elements, even than its leadership, than the men who received the paper with the words, you are entrusted with command. Thus, in April 1944, no one was in command of the invasion of Europe. No man would have been capable of doing that. There were men who commanded individual sections, bases, divisions, armies, but the whole thing together was too enormous. In April, Montgomery could not have added literally another thousand yards to the offensive front. 
Eisenhower could delay the start by a day or two, but any change he made in the timetable for landing troops would be disastrous. Any millions of parts made up this machine. No human imagination could conceive of it. The strangest thing about the historic invasion of Europe on June 6 was precisely that no one was essentially in command of it. Two men, Roosevelt and Churchill, had at one time agreed that it should take place. But there was no sole command. The plan itself had been worked out over a number of years. It had its roots in the experience of the first commandos. It was not the creation of one brilliant mind. As we have seen, it was drawn up by the method of elimination, by selecting the least impossible directions and operations. It was the fruit of hard, painstaking labor. And when the plan was finished, printed, bound, and numbered, the group of men who had worked on it were disbanded. None of them played any significant role in its realization. But by the time Eisenhower and Montgomery took charge of the European theater of operations, the plan had already grown to such proportions that no major changes could be made to it by them. Not Bernard Montgomery, but the plan was truly in charge. The reinforcement of the first wave in January did not essentially change the basic concept. The Normandy coast was chosen simply because conditions there were less unfavorable than to the north and south of it. General Eisenhower, of course, had nothing to do with directing the invasion. Honestly complying with the terms worked out in Tehran, he only signed the powers of attorney that he issued to his three British commanders-in-chief, as predicted by the British R, and they made sure that their prediction came true. Eisenhower in England was fully occupied with the political functions of commander-in-chief, with the troops he came into contact only during official reviews. Not only that the land, sea, and air forces had separate commanders-in-chief, these three persons themselves coordinated their actions, forming a kind of super syndicate. Eisenhower's role in the purely military field was reduced to mediating between them and the command of the long-range air forces. Of all the armed forces in England, only the latter were not an integral part of the Overlord plan. To strengthen air training was supposed to divert them from the main task of destroying German industry but the air support for the invasion was mainly assigned to the fighter and medium bomber formations commanded by Lee Mallory. Thus, although officially the responsibility lay with Eisenhower, in fact his role in leading the invasion was reduced to pacing from corner to corner and listening to the weather forecasters who reported to him that all was well. But even the three British commanders-in-chief E, a general, an admiral, and a chief air marshal, despite their enormous responsibilities, could do little more. They were masters, not managers. Masters, at times overburdened to the point of overloading themselves with the work of coordinating actions of historic importance, but powerless to change anything in the very quality of those actions. Such is the nature of any combined operation. On land, the general is really in command. He can order his troops to advance and retreat, maneuver, and make demonstrations. Depending on his orders, the battle may be won or lost. The man nominally in command of a combined invasion force is another matter. He cannot increase the number of troops because there are not enough ships to transport them. He cannot even reduce that number because all the parts of the plan are so closely intertwined that changing one part of it would shift all the others. He cannot significantly alter the actions of his troops in time or space. Like everyone else, he is simply a servile laborer unquestioningly carrying out the will of the plan. Of all the senior commanders, Bradley was the closest to the concept of a free man. He was only a junior master of the American shop, subordinate to a Burmaster Montgomery. But it was because of this humble position that he had a little time and inner strength to think about what he would do with his troops when they crossed into France, and he could do something about it. The strategic plan that Bradley subsequently followed on the continent took shape in outline for him in these months before the invasion. Even before his troops sailed off the coast of England, Bradley had a clear picture of how to use them to best effect against the German army. Montgomery did not show the slightest interest in Bradley's ideas. After all, Bradley was just one of his generals, and to treat him as an equal. He saw no more reason to treat him as an equal than the commander of the subordinate Canadian or even British army. 
It was not in the spirit of English military tradition or in Montgomery's character to listen to creative ideas of strategy or tactics expressed by subordinate commanders. His own ideas for action on the continent had even Devers. He tried to interest them in the British. Unlike him, Bradley kept his ideas to himself, now he thought ahead. About the time when the pre-bridge fortifications will already be established, when he will fulfill the first task assigned to him under the plan, the capture of Cherbourg Peninsula, he busied himself studying the terrain south to southeast of the landing area, figuring out how he might respond to certain enemy moves. All this time I was either encamped near Portsmouth, where I attended meetings of the British headquarters, or carried around the south coast of England in a jeep and a communications plane, visiting more American units and observing the training preparations for the invasion. Relations between the Americans and the British became more relaxed, but the general tension was growing. The great day was approaching. One of the greatest games in history was about to be played. Now looking back at that time from the post-war world, it is difficult to recreate that mood, just as it is difficult to remember my pre-dawn feelings when the sun is already high in the sky and there is nothing mysterious left in the landscape. In the winter of 1944, everything on the other side of the channel was surrounded by mystery and breathed menace. What lay ahead of us had no precedent. The veterans of the campaigns in Africa and Sicily, of whom there were very few, had nothing to comfort us, and the more they knew, the less joyful it was. For they seemed to have memorized only chaos and destruction, and the utter dependence of the success of the combined operation on chance, on the weather, and on the mistakes of the enemy. The serious rehearsals we had been conducting only spoiled our spirits. The plan was to conduct a series of exercises on an ever larger scale, and with the participation of increasing numbers of men and vessels. This was both for training and to confuse the Germans. When large groups of our ships went to sea, the Germans were alarmed, but nothing happened, and they became more careless. And for us, these classes were supposed to give us practical experience, but during the winter and the beginning of spring, they were going worse and worse time after time. It seemed that the strength of all the participants, from the commander to the last infantryman, was barely enough to gather the troops on the shore, load them on ships and land them again on another area, representing the enemy's coast. By the time of the landing, there was unimaginable confusion. Important equipment was lost, no one remembered the plans, any idea of order disappeared. It was very hard to stand on some cliff, imagining yourself a German commander, and watch the waves of attackers run up on the shore and mix into a pile, forming a perfect target. The vehicles slammed their wheels into the sand and got stuck. They were flooded with water in shallow places, overturned on the dunes, bogged down in the swamps. Looking at this hopeless confusion, I thought, how can we organize out of all this chaos an attack strong enough to break through the defenses of a coast protected by the strongest fortifications in the world? I knew too much about this coast from the big, intimidating maps. Every point on aerial photographs was enlarged, and diligent topographers depicted in its place wires, concrete, mines, guns, underwater obstacles, anti-tank ditches and artillery batteries. One could not believe that the attacking units that would come from across the stormy grey English Channel would be able to breach this formidable wall. So the three big exercises in the Channel. The last one was the most chaotic. At the end of it we were quite downhearted and began to think that maybe the pessimists were right. Nothing was going to work. We saw it with our own eyes. Read the reports of the commanders of the units. Knew that all our wonderful schedules had gone in vain. And after all, the ships had travelled only a few miles along the coast, turned back and landed the troops on their own land. We had to console ourselves with boring considerations like the fact that combined operations, always making such an impression, that before the landing in Africa, the forecasts were even more gloomy, and that the invasion of Sicily was a success, even after an unexpected storm had battered our transports. There was another thing we feared. None of those who had experienced German air raids in one of our Mediterranean ports did not allow the idea that the invasion fleet could go to sea without interference. 
In the Mediterranean, the Germans could throw a tiny number of airplanes at one point at a time, and still they scattered troops and sank ships. On the channel ports will be directed the full force of the German Air Force, especially since its bases are little more than a hundred miles away. At such a serious moment, they will not stop before losses, just to thwart the invasion. During the exercises, only a small number of ships were used each time, but as we watched them, we saw that all the tiny ports of southern England and the great harbour of Southampton, along with Southampton Harbour, are packed with vessels like miniature replicas of Pearl Harbour. It seemed that if a bomber dropped even a pea, it could not fail to hit its target. Finally, waking up one morning, we learned that during the night German torpedo boats had penetrated a caravan of our tank landing craft some ten miles off Portland Bill, sunk two of them, and ripped the stern off the third. The Americans lost 500 or 600 men wounded and drowned. These were mostly engineers and technicians. With them went down and the material that was needed at the beginning of the invasion, Bulldozers for clearing obstacles and portable roads for motorized vehicles on the sand. If the Germans could do all this on our side of the channel, the situation was serious. Why did the Germans attack now? Clearly because they hoped to capture prisoners and find out our plans. At this exercise for the first time fully rehearsed combat order of the assault echelon, it already included and secret weapons. Missile-powered boats and amphibious tanks. D.D. In Africa, in Sicily and in Salerno, engineers and infantry had to land first to prepare a relatively safe landing armoured forces. In Normandy, however, we were going to act in reverse order to send forward all-terrain tanks. These secret tanks starred always, even on transitions, covered with black covers. During the exercise was also supposed to check the readiness of our firepower and the distance from which to open fire rocket and other guns. Had the Germans taken prisoners, and if they had, what were these prisoners known? The preservation of military secrecy is based on the principle that everyone should know only what is necessary for the fulfilment of his task. All information that may be useful to the enemy is divided into categories. For official use, not subject to disclosure, secret and so on, and in each case, fewer and fewer officers and soldiers are privy to them during operations in Europe. The American secret corresponded to the English top secret. And then came the top secret information, which included detailed plans for the invasion. The organization of attacking waves and the distribution of supporting branches of the army, but did not include the place and time of the invasion. This last top secret information went under the designation bigot. The officer who had the right to know and did know where and when the invasion would begin was called a bigot. Among the officers engaged in the exercise, which was interrupted by the Germans, there were twenty, perhaps more, bigots. That is, those who knew on what part of the coast the landing would take place, and in what month, and in what phase of the moon. By the end of Exercise Tiger, thousands of people had top-secret information because they had conducted the very real dress rehearsal. The British Admiralty, whose representatives were in the area of the exercise, found that the transports had been attacked by the Germans on their way to their destination. Thus, the troops on them had no way of knowing what they were to do. If the Germans had caught them on the way back, each private would have been so stuffed with top-secret information that he would have been worth sending to Berlin for questioning. But what became of the bigot officers? The Admiralty representative on Montgomery's staff reported that, according to the investigation, the torpedo boats could not have taken prisoners. It is characteristic of Montgomery, and perhaps of every army officer, that he did not let himself be persuaded and ordered a new investigation. Quite by chance I happened to take part in it. The fact is that the American engineers engaged in the exercise were from an engineer and airborne brigade, and I spent the first year of my military service as a member of the command of the engineer and airborne troops. At eight o'clock in the morning I received orders to get into a staff car and try to find some acquaintance who had seen with his own eyes all that had happened. After driving around for eight hours, I found two lieutenants who had observed the whole picture from the deck of the transport that had had its stern blown off 
by a torpedo. Their account differed considerably from the Admiralty reports. The Admiralty believed that the Germans could not take prisoners, because their boats, having struck, ran away from the fire of convoy ships. My lieutenants told me that if the convoy ships fired on the gunboats, it was somewhere over the horizon, for they did not see any convoy ships near the sunken ships. The dead transports went directly ahead and behind the one on which my acquaintances were. The vessels went down in a blaze of exploding ammunition. The boat which attacked the transport of my acquaintances first torpedoed its stern, stood motionless, swaying on the dark waves, and then had the nerve to turn on the searchlight, which illuminated the heads of people floundering in the water. After circling among them, the boat finally disappeared into the darkness. He certainly had the opportunity to pick up the drowning men. When this and other information reached the main headquarters, there was a great deal of excitement, for in the meantime it appeared that about ten bigot officers had gone missing. There was a day when there was serious discussion at Montgomery's headquarters of the necessity of changing the whole operation, for the enemy was thought to be thoroughly aware of almost all our plans. Hundreds of drowned men were never found, but the corpses of the bigot officers were found every one of them. They surfaced on their waterproof inflatable jackets and were identified, and those prisoners that the Germans could capture mistakenly believed that the invasion would follow the same plan as in Sicily and Salerno. The tactics we had chosen were still a mystery. This tactic was now of interest to all future invasion participants. From Montgomery and Bradley to the soldiers who sweated in the training battles in the north of England and stormed Nutter-Mate German fortifications, it didn't matter about strategy now. It was necessary to cross to the mainland and get a foothold there. To spit on high politics and no matter who would command what, to spit on everything in the world, just to get to the dunes of Normandy. Everyone had his place in the complicated procedure of boarding the ships. One could be sure of this when looking from the air at the sausages and rows of tiny tents in the egg-shaped camps. Sausages were called areas, where the component parts of the invasion force were concentrated because they were shaped like sausages on the map. Each occupied four or five miles of road and fields on either side of it. Camps were set up in the fields. The sausages slid, parallel one to the other, down the hills almost to a strip of low bank, all along the south coast of England. Each sausage had five or six eggs, what were called permanent tented camps. Each camp had a small staff of guards, its own kitchen and mess hall. The camps were carefully camouflaged, but still from the air the rows of tents were clearly visible, so that camouflage was used mainly for the purpose of hiding from the enemy whether there were troops in the camp or not. Throughout the spring the eggs and sausages were filled and emptied and filled again, so that even if this movement had been seen from the air, the final preparations for the operation could not have been distinguished from a rehearsal. Troops passed through the sausages without staying there for long. Their uniforms were turned in to be impregnated with a compound that made them waterproof, and the permanent staff of these marching hotels fed and served them during their brief rest. Civilian traffic along the entire southern coast had long been prohibited, and even officers were not allowed to enter the sausages themselves without special passes. When troops were in the sausages, their transports filled the entire roadside. The vehicles huddled together under every tree, and in open places they hid under camouflage nets. If you looked closely, you could see that their motors and moving parts were covered with a thick layer of preservative grease, a temporary pipe protruded from each machine through which the motor breathed. This waterproof layer allowed the vehicles to move in water, even if it reached the driver's waist, but only for short distances because the motors would quickly overheat. After the crossing, the waterproof layer had to be removed as soon as the first. Low strip of bank was crossed. This procedure required half an hour for each car, no matter how many people were involved. Among other pleasures we were to have was this. Cleaning the cars from the waterproof layer under enemy fire. In the entire embarkation area, traffic was allowed only one way, and special maps were issued with red and blue road networks. By one net the troops went down through the sausages to the shore, by the other they climbed back up.
During the exercises, each vehicle made a complete circle. On the day of the actual landing, they had only to go all the way to the sea, and only the ambulances with the wounded were to go back. Evacuation stations, hospital tents, operating rooms under tents, and a burial service had already been set up around the sausages to receive them. Passing by them, the troops saw how there from morning till night washed and cleaned. Scalpels and dressing materials were prepared to meet the misfortune in full armour. Behind the hospitals were supply stations, artillery depots, repair shops, bakeries and communications battalions with huge skeins of copper wire that soon stretched across France. The whole great army of the invasion was there, drawn together with the utmost precision, like the cogs and wheels of clockwork. It all lurked among the soft green of the Devonshire hills, so neat and peaceful, so unlike the dirty, furious horde into which it had become when thrown into battle on the enemy's shore. Thinking about that time, one remembers how clean everywhere was, how neat and tidy everyone looked, how new cars were. Small summer hotels and resorts stretching along the coast were swarming with infantrymen in khaki and green caps. The resort houses could not accommodate them. Soldiers peered out of every window to gaze at the spectacle of which they themselves were participants. On the hills in the best hotels with gardens were some Red Cross clubs. From there the whole coast was visible, with its wire barriers and hedgehogs, and the little flotillas of the invasion fleet glided from bay to bay, practicing, rehearsing. Along the road along the shore moved a stream of vehicles. These were not the vehicles of the first echelon. Those stood sheltered in their sausages, but simply the transportation necessary for daily communication and coordination. Far out to sea, barely visible, dots loomed the patrol destroyers. Closer to shore, a small barrage balloon hung over almost every ship, and behind anti-aircraft guns crowded on every eminence, and the sun glinted on the observer's binoculars with which he slowly and tirelessly circled the sky. Overhead, fighter planes circled smoothly, and even higher at times stretched the white trail of a bomber. While we were practicing, these were already working. Weeks passed, the rehearsals became more and more impressive, and it was clear to anyone uninitiated that we had only a few days to wait. In the middle of May, after serving for several months as an American observer at the British General Headquarters, I decided that I would learn nothing new here and began to look for a job with the troops. I went under Colonel Edson Ruff. His military specialty was parachuting, but on the day of the invasion he commanded a special forces unit of tanks, cavalry, and gliders with infantry. His task was to fight his way through enemy positions after the landing to link up with the 82nd Parachute Division, dropped to the rear of the coastal fortifications. On June 1, I took my gear out of the tent under the old trees where we lived with the 21st Army Group and made it into a bundle compact enough to be strapped to a jeep, not forgetting to slip my gas mask underwear into it. And then I departed for Devonshire, to the town of Dartmouth, where Ruff's group was already assembled in its sausage, stocked with food and fuel and waterproofed, and joined it. Now, non-stop all the way to France, 